The Land at Scale program aims to strengthen essential land governance components for men, women and youth to contribute to structural, just, sustainable and inclusive change at scale in lower and middle income countries, regions and landscapes. This program is supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Knowledge management is essential to the effective implementation of the Land at Scale program. It is conceived in a comprehensive and adaptive way that integrates documentation, learning and sharing. Knowledge management means bringing in state-of-the-art insights to strengthen interventions, reaching out to make relevant knowledge available to the right people at the right time, and sharing lessons learned in the program with a wide audience. In this series of short videos, we explore three key aspects of the knowledge management program within Land at Scale. These are adaptive programming, South-South exchange, and monitoring and evaluation. Each of the video presents evidence and insights from experts working in the land governance sector. This video is focused on monitoring and evaluation and how it relates to knowledge management. Monitoring and evaluation is used to assess the performance of projects with the goal of improving current and future management of outputs, outcomes, and impacts. In this video, experts answer a range of questions that provide insights in their experiences. Um, ILC has a combined M&E system, let's say. We measure impact uh, mainly through our LandX initiative, and then we have our corporate monitoring and evaluation in which we report mainly on changes in policies and practices. And in doing so, we balance both qualitative and quantitative information and use them both to tell our stories, analyze our results, and monitor them. In the past triennium, we have introduced our contribution analysis that we usually do on uh, country level uh, initiatives, namely our national engagement strategies. So for initiatives that have an impact at country level, let's say. And we do these, uh, we have undertaken these to better map IHC's contribution to changes in policies and practices for people-centered land governance, that is our goal. And we also do them to get this description that we find out through this analysis recognized and verified by a wider audience that is usually the platform that undertakes um, the national engagement strategy. And in doing so, this uh, analysis basically, we present also lessons learned as well as challenges on ways to progress further. So I said, we kind of balance both quantitative and qualitative descriptions of change, because as we know, when it comes to advocacy policy change, numbers count, but they have to be counterbalanced by a description of those numbers. And that is exactly what we try to do. In terms, you, you definitely need a combination of quantitative and, and qualitative. For, for knowledge management, there are certain quantitative indicators that you can use as, a, as an entry point. But I would very much caution that they should be entry points only and not just taken um, you know, taken as a measure by themselves. So put more positively, you need to make sure that those quantitative indicators are actually capturing the, um, your target audience. I think that is one issue. I think the, you know, one of the challenges that we always faced is what level do you set for your quantitative indicators? I mean, um, you can, you have certain reference points um, in, you know, in communication success as, as the land portal knows better than, than anyone really, um, that you can have, um, you know, uh, sort of average figures that you can use as, as reference points. But I think it's very difficult to judge, you know, what, what sort of target you should be setting. I think that uh, qualitative indicators um, are, you know, are, are particularly important in terms of people's response, um, endorsement of 
uh, of the knowledge that you have been generating. It can be uh, a challenge to set up that, um, that system. We had uh, um, an ME log where we would put in, um, you know, we, we would archive every, every email that came in with an endorsement or a positive recommendation. Um, but then we had to follow that up with, with surveys, you know, targeted at, at particularly important groups and stakeholders um, to ask them to, to respond um, about how useful they had found the knowledge generated. And one of the problems there actually is, is, is always people's limited capacity res to respond, you know, given their other pressures. The, our, the work, the scope of work we are doing is very complex in the sense that you cannot use one uh, methodology to, to address the issue. You need a triangulation. You need to bring out mixed method. You need to be more quantitative and more qualitative. And it is really fascinating to see how qualitative information are, are, are makes bring out some nuisance in an uh, important um, um, revelation and finding on what we are doing. We measure perception, we measure level of participation, which are, it, it gives you more uh, narrative on how these numbers, like for example, um, uh, number of hectares, number of communities are, are developed, are ca came to be. Just the number without the explanation behind where these numbers are from and how and what, it's not sufficient. It is not important to give you the full um, story of the reality happening on the ground. We have uh, developed this uh, methodology, let's say, that we call contribution analysis, in which we analyze what happens in a country or in a given initiative. And these contribution analysis were thought and were designed to have a reflection workshop with the platforms, with the actors of those platforms, to learn from their achievements, but also on the challenges and to use those lessons learned for future planning. Unfortunately, and since COVID hit, um, the platform has been mostly engaged in verifying the results that we have been seeing rather than really participating in these reflection uh, workshops. So with this new strategy and with the new M&E strategy and system that is starting uh, next year, we will further strengthen this cycle where we want to collaborate more uh, with learning, more with, uh, with um, communications, but we have also included knowledge management in this uh, cycle because we see in our experience that the m and &E information and data and also the analysis that comes with it um, is the starting point to finally then get a better communication to a wider audience on what IELTS achieves, what the challenges were and so on. That, as I said, we go through learning and reflecting on those challenges and how to um, kind of improve in the future. But we also include now in these contribution analysis that are central to our system, let's say, we include knowledge management as part of the exercise in further examining what comes out and what is presented in the contribution analysis and which good practice emerged from them so that they can be further used in other learning exercises and exchanges between platforms, for example. It is part of our strategy and um, we are now uh, um, developing it, uh, an integrated um, uh, um, approach so that it could be strongly integrated monitoring and uh, learning and knowledge development. We have a, a, um, the, the, the framework that has been developed, which unfortunately, I cannot, I, it's difficult to share with you during this interview. So you see the different um, components. And uh, now we are in the, this next phase is 
to really uh, integrate it. But since we, uh, the tenure facility was um, still very young organization growing, we started piloting uh, this in a ad hoc manner and trying to gather some of the data, seeing how it can work. And then now it is the time now we are streamlining and integrating it and into the system. Um, I tend to go back again to this uh, contribution analysis because these are really our central, uh, let's say, M&E work. Uh, in which we really try to link uh, those um, contribution analysis workshops, these reflection moments to planning moments, which means that we have a first a moment in which uh, members together sit and reflect on the results they have achieved and also on the challenges they have faced and the setbacks and so on to use uh, those reflections in further planning to adapt what they uh, plan to uh, what they what is has been emerging from the past. Also, uh, in general, um, these contribution analysis that are evaluations of what we do take in consideration longer time frames. So, for example, in some cases, even the whole life of an initiative that can go up to ten uh, years. In this, in doing these analysis, you clearly see that little setbacks can still be part of a successful story. So especially when it comes to policy influencing, uh, making sure that those policies get implemented, it takes such a long time frame to actually see change happening that no setback is really a setback. Um, it really starts with having a relationship of, of trust and a lot of um, transparency and continuous discussion. I think if um, project implementers feel that they can talk to the, um, the project supervisors from the funders side uh, very openly about what is what is happening and can demonstrate that they are, you know, they're doing their utmost um, to, uh, to implement the project effectively, then having that relationship of trust makes it makes it possible to to, to, to have a safe space, I think, to talk about what is going wrong and um, what is not. And I think one way of really helping to set up that, that relationship and be very clear about expectations is having, you know, a solid, um, you know, reason, reasonable period of time for the inception period. No project is being punished for not being achieved a, a target in the sense that tenure security is not an end goal. It is really important for us to understand this. That's why in some, we talk about advancing tenure. It's a process. And when you break it down as a process-based indicators and look at what have been achieved within that two years towards tenure security, then you will have a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of best practice that you can package and knowledge a product. Uh, ILT has been um, producing good practices and requesting good practices from its member for members from a long time. So when in m and &E we uh, do our analysis or our evaluations, we always use uh, these good practices as part of the wealth of information that are, is necessary to understand uh, what our members have been doing country level or in their initiatives. So definitely these are always a source, these good practices from our members are always a source for information when it comes to our evaluations. We have um, collected um, more than 150 good practices that are part of um, a database uh, that is available to everyone. 
um, the database of good practices uh, aims at um, pulling together important uh, contents that can inform um, members and uh, other users uh, of uh, the work of our members and also uh, inform people about um, what uh, our members have done to overcome certain challenges. So the focus is on uh, the tools, the processes and the methodologies that they have come up with and um, implemented to um, improve uh, their um, situation at country level to overcome specific challenges um, and to uh, achieve uh, people-centered land governance. That's while certain processes can be abstracted and uh, uh, afterwards replicated by others, um, they are often uh, quite context specific. And so it's important also to uh, describe uh, the context in which uh, they were um, they, they were um, implemented. A very uh, concrete example is that in, in Legend, we did an in-depth review of um, land tenure regularization at scale. So how to um, increase, you know, improve tenure security at scale. And we did a review of the UK government's programs um, to, to regularize land tenure and pulled out some some really strong lessons from that, you know, about the, the operationalization of it, um, about the theory of change, um, and about the importance of, of political economy analysis. And those lessons have been um, taken forward into the design of the technical assistance facility that the UK government is, um, is, is going to launch and the decision support unit that will a company that um, with which has a strong, obviously a strong knowledge management function and a strong um, M and D function. Uh, you know the lessons from that uh, that report, that review, were disseminated amongst um, the range of of donors uh, through the donor working group on land, um, and having that coordination mechanism and and being able to direct learning to a group of funders who can talk, use that then to discuss their own experiences, I think is really, is really crucial. Let me use uh, Liberia, where we, uh, the tenure facility conducted a, 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 a pilot process there before the, the enactment of the land, uh, land right law. And during that uh, pilot process, all the, the knowledge um, um, products from that pilot process have been very instrumental in the in in the enactment of the the the, 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 the legal framework, and it is has been very now very useful now in the me process. For example, during the pilot. The pilot helped to develop um, um, a staff identification guide, which is now the foundation and the, the first step in the process of um, um, formalization of uh, customary land right in Liberia. And this step is now really integrated in the Project Me uh, process and how they report on, on how these, the different um, communities are organizing, self-organizing their self following that guidelines in that uh, uh, self-identification protocol, which was a, a product, a knowledge product in, um, uh, from the tenure facility pilot and a knowledge product that the government also buy in and make it as a legal, as a, one of the legal, um, uh, the regulatory framework for the implementation of the Land Rights uh, Act. Uh, 